Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've just interacted with a wonderful group of students already. Well, let me, I'll be continuing mostly on the book that Anna mentioned, and I would like to do several things. First, let's talk about the record of Russia's foreign policy and different theories whether or not they apply to it. Then, what is honor as Russians see it? What are some of the historical cases that you might be able to use? And I'll give a brief overview of six cases, not all cases that I use in the book. And then I will conclude also with implications for understanding contemporary Russia's foreign policy, understanding Putin's behavior specifically. Well, let me be brief with theories and simply state what everyone knows, that there are several families of theories of foreign policy. Uh, there is no master variable, so to speak, but multiple explanations that they each apply. There is power and security emphasis as emphasized by realists. There is emphasis on values and norms as highlighted by constructivists. And then there is emphasis on political and economic institutions, and leadership, regime, nature, and that's a more or less accepted liberal theory of international relations. And there are tensions, of course, within each of those theories. There is a debate between aggressive and defensive realism within realism, and there is an argument over domestic as opposed to international norms within constructivism and liberalism. So theories don't really agree with each other, which is, which is okay, which is normal. Let's first take a look at the record of Russia's foreign policy. Unfortunately, the slide is too small, but I'll comment on this, and it will become clear what it contains. Uh, the record is such, and I've tried to establish it in the book, is that Russia historically follows three trajectories, three traditions, you might call them. One is cooperation with the West in relations with the West. Another one is defensive foreign policy, and last but not least, assertive foreign policy. So first, on cooperation. Russia, of course, historically built relationships with the West, entered alliances and built institutions with Western nations. It had ties historically with Holy Roman Empire. It joined the Holy League against the Ottoman Empire, as some of you might recall. Then, of course, stretching, moving forward, Peter the Great also wanted to build relationships with Europe. He organized a grand embassy trip to Europe, trying to build relationships against the hegemonic power of Sweden at the time in Europe. Catherine the Great pronounced Russia to be a European power. The 19th century Holy Alliance was also European coalition that Russia initiated in response to rights of Napoleon and organized with the idea of suppressing revolutions across the European continent. Then there were three emperors league with Germany and Austro-Hungary Empire. Then of course Antant in the late 19th and early 20th century, the alliance with <coughs> France and Britain, even Bolsheviks wanted to maintain relationships and cooperate with the West. And you will recall specifically the notion of peaceful coexistence that Bolsheviks championed at the time in order to promote collective security in Europe and in order to stop Hitler from rising. And then if you scroll forward, there will be Helsinki Agreement, and SCE in the, in the 70s, Gorbachev's common human values, common European home, Yeltsin, positive reintegration, quote unquote, with the West. And then of course, Russia fought against common enemy frequently in alliance with Western nations. The first northern war against Sweden in 17th century, seven years war against Russia in 18th century, the fourth, the fourth the war against the Polonic France, the first and second world war, all were fought in some coalition with Western powers. And in the 21st century, if we apply this, this same concept, then Russia did want and continues to want to fight global war and terrorism in cooperation with Western nations. That's the first tradition, that's the first pattern of cooperation with the West. The second one 
is what I call defensiveness in the book. And defensiveness is a retreat into a relative isolation to gather domestic strengths. This is when Russia's interests and values are not accepted by Western nations, they are challenged, and Russia does not feel strong enough to counteract. In this case, Russia is not likely to become a junior partner, but Russia instead retreats into relative isolation to gather domestic strengths and then to return to war politics. That's what Russia did, for example, after being defeated by Poland in the early 17th century until, until it revived its assertiveness first by building special relationships with Ukraine in 1654. Uh, then Russia also pursued neutrality from the war with Sweden in the 18th century. After the Crimean War, defeat in the Crimean War, Russia, of course, was in no position to launch counteroffense, and it pursued instead what was called concentration strategy, flexible alliances with Western at the time, British and French uh, governments, and with Prussia in Austria as well. Bolsheviks, example, is post-revolutionary era. This is when the idea of world revolution was defeated. This is where Stalin came to replace Trotsky and Lenin and said, enough is enough, that is not working, so let's pursue a peaceful coexistence instead. There, of course, was a pact with Hitler, which also was, was viewed by the Soviets as a defensive policy, uh, because they felt that they, the Western nations themselves were negotiating in secret with, with uh, Germany, and Stalin needed to win at least a couple of years before there would be a major war. And then after the war, after the Cold War, Russia, of course, maneuvered between the West and China. If you will recall Eugenie Primakov's reaction to NATO expansion, that was one of the attempts to establish uh, the basis for recovery. Primakov, of course, was in no position to promote and pursue assertive foreign policy. Russia in the 90s is a separate story of essentially a uh, weak state and collapsing economy, but he was also not willing to join as a junior partner with the West, so he maneuvered between the West and China after the Cold War and built special relationships with Germany and France, but at the same time tried to build a coalition with India and, uh, and China, unsuccessful. The third pattern, uh, pattern is assertiveness. This is where Russia challenges the West from a position of perceived strength. And of course, Russia fought multiple wars, dozens and dozens of wars with Poland, the Ottoman Empire, to secure its long borders, to protect Balkan Slavs in the 17th century. It, of course, defeated Sweden in the early 18th century. It fought multiple wars with Turks before the Crimean War. And after the, after the Crimean War, it again returned to the Balkans. Uh, the Soviets, too, uh, frequently engaged in this in this um, type of assertive foreign policy, although one might differentiate between the Soviet type of assertiveness and pre-Soviet one. Obviously, the doctrine of the world revolution ultimately establishing the Soviet the Soviet responsibility and the Soviet values across the world was one example of this. The Cold War policies of presence in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, human missile crisis the invasion of Afghanistan. These Soviet policies are well known in the certain world sort of to demonstrate that Russia would counterattack to defend what it sees its important interests. After the Cold War, the best example is Georgia South Ossetia conflict, <coughs> when Russia intervened against <coughs> the Western wardens, and more recently, of course, the Ukraine crisis and Russia's intervention in Ukraine is in many respects a continuation of the same pattern. So what can we do with this record, I asked in the book? Can we use this fabulous of theories to make sense of it? And the first thing to say here is that they are limited. Each of them are limited in some respects. Realism says that foreign policies or major powers are rarely cooperative. Sometimes they cooperate. They call it bandwagoning, but temporarily, and for the purpose of balance. Why? Because it's hard for foreign, for 
the great powers to cooperate with each other. They have their own distinct interests. And so balancing is more typical. And foreign policy is either defensive or assertive. Only weak powers would cooperate really in uh, realist vocabulary. And of course, these assumptions and this logic runs into problems with Russia. For example, it's hard to make sense of Gorbachev as an overseer of strategic retreat, as Leo is classifying him, rather than a visionary, someone who is driven by certain ideas, by certain beliefs, certain visions. And there are other cases that realism underestimates and prefers not to notice. In his book on great power politics, John Mirsheimer, for example, completely neglects the case of the Holy Alliance when Alexander the first initiated the idea of wide region cooperation in Europe, and when he withdrew from Paris after defeating Napoleon, he did not stay in Paris, but withdrew and proposed a new arrangement, a new institutional arrangement. The realists at the time expected him either to form European hegemony, to become essentially another France, or another Sweden, or to move into a splendid isolation. Realists inside in the Alexander the First Court recommend, recommend, recommend such steps. Nevertheless, he did what he did. He withdrew and formed a very expansive holy alliance. So realism is limited. And so, so is liberalism. Liberalism typically says that foreign policy of Western powers are cooperative if the West is a good example. If the West is institutionally strong, then ultimately they will cooperate. There might be some resistance based on their own cultural and political institutions, and they, it may not be as successful if the West does not pose a good example. But in principle, Russia will cooperate. If Russia is not strong enough, and if the West is a powerful example, powerful set of institutions, then Russia will come around. This is what we often hear, not just from academic liberals, but also from Western media. Putin is bluffing. He will ultimately have to settle for what we have to offer. There is one quote from Vice President Joseph Biden, public statement several years ago. The reality is that Russians are where they are. So this implication that Russians will have no choice but to agree to work with the United States. They have a shrinking population base. They have a withering economy. They have a banking sector structure that is not likely to be able to withstand the next 15 years. They are in a situation when the world is changing before them, and they are clinging to something in the past that is not sustainable. That's a very common thing, very common thinking uh, by, by uh, uh, U.S. politician who probably was schooled in some respects in liberal, uh, liberal assumptions. But as Realists would say, as a classic realist once said, his name was Clemens von Metternich, Russia is never as strong as we fear, but it never is as weak as we hope. So Russia's capabilities may not be as strong, but Russian leaders sometimes believe that they are strong enough and they act as if Russia was a global power, and that makes a difference in foreign relations. The recent the uh, recent developments, not just the way Putin acted in Ukraine, but if you scroll back to Syria initiative, Russia's assertiveness with respect to the Middle East, also demonstrate insufficiency of this thinking, of these assumptions. And then, if you recall the so-called reset era under the previous president, Mitri Medvedev, it did not go as far as President Obama expected did not go as far despite Russia's weakness. Russia certainly suffered greatly from the global financial crisis, <coughs> lost 9% of its economy, and quickly lost the confidence that it had. But at the same time, Russia refused to comply with most of Western institutions and human rights pressures at the time. And so the question of whether sanctions will work is, is an important one, but it's very unlikely that these sanctions, pressures, are going to make a difference unless we understand what Russia's behavior is. So there are some restrictive assumptions, restrictive 
rationalist assumptions that both realists and liberals make. And I think constructivism has some promise in this respect, the remedy for the weaknesses of these assumptions. There are different approaches in constructivism. One of them is associated with this colon in Alexander Penn. And that one emphasizes mostly external influences, informal and social influences. And others, like Ted Hoff, emphasize domestic values, habits, um, and social influences. Constructivism has promise because it is more sensitive to domestic values, domestic approaches, and traditions, but it is also incomplete. It is incomplete because it frequently refuses to engage this power. It is not, it is not fit to take into consideration some objective indicators to discuss the power of the international structure. So it's insufficient uh, overall. What I've tried to do, I've tried to integrate some insights from constructivism and from realism and build a uh, synthesis, if synthesis is possible. Probably not a synthesis, but some combination. And I introduced uh, uh, the approach that has three concepts, three notions, and I'll discuss those in a minute. But I should say that I'm not particularly interested in individual decisions. I'm more interested in strategic outlook of foreign policy elites. I'm more interested in how Russian foreign policy change from one state to another, from assertiveness to cooperation and vice versa. And that's where I find these three concepts helpful. These three concepts are vision, confidence, and recognition. The VCR, not the video cassette recorder, but vision, confidence, and recognition. So vision is simply a complex of ideas and values that guide nation in foreign policy. It's not a variable. It's something that helps us to discover the context in which foreign policy takes place. And we need to establish a context of a particular vision by asking questions, what kind of values are promoted? What kind of interests are defended? Is it similar from what others insist upon? And the expectation here is that the more distinct your vision is, then the more likely your foreign policy will deviate from others who insist on their own distinctiveness. It's important because it has the context in which decision-making takes place and because national interests are not objective. They usually are formed by distinct values, distinct identities. And realism, of course, assumes that Russians want power or status or security. Liberals assume that Kremlin wants somehow to increase domestic power among different factions. But they don't really ask why Russia wants power. What does it mean to the Kremlin to have it? What is it going to do with this power? And what identity leads to this power? And so that might become a problem. And from my work, I found that this actually becomes a problem misinterpreting, for instance, the case that I already mentioned to you, the whole alliance. Again, so many people expected him to become the European hegemon. This is what so many people are afraid of Russia trying to do now, to become the next hegemon at least in the Eastern Central European space. But the answer is he didn't because he believed in Christian autocracy. He believed in values of Christian autocracy at the time. It wasn't about status or power only for him. It was the right thing to do to withdraw. It was the honorable thing to do, as he himself put it. And the honor in this context is the self dignity and moral commitment to the relevant social community, in his case, to Christians, not only to Orthodox Christians, but to Christians in general, to the European Christians. That was the honorable thing for Alexander I, and for many Russian czars, honor had to do with Eastern Christianity specifically, and with the idea of politically dominant and socially responsible paternalistic state as well. That concept, too, has roots in Eastern Christianity. So that's one concept. The second one is confidence. This is where we need to understand Russia's perception and self-perception of strengths, specifically. How strong, the questions to ask here is how strong or weak Russia is in the perception of its leaders. What vulnerabilities and strengths 
these statements, political statements, might reveal. And again, the alternative approach here is to say, well, Russia is objectively weak. Look, its GDP is not growing impressively. It has other limitations. Power capabilities simply are no match to our the American power capabilities. And that's something that has been quite common uh, to hear in the, in the Western political circles, that Russia simply is no match to, to us. Uh, what makes a difference, though, is a perception rather than reality in this case. If Putin feels strong enough, then he will act assertively, even though objectively his economy is not as powerful as you might think. So the stronger this perception is, the more active or assertive foreign policy will become. I already gave you a couple of examples. Alexander is one. Putin's assertive foreign policy is shaped by his perception of Russia as effectively rising power rather than declining power. Because he came to power, as you remember, 15 years ago when the economy was not functioning, and was Russia was, uh, was um, uh, really shrinking, and the economy and the uh, political classes were redividing the country. So he feels that he has accomplished a great deal over these years, and Russia continues to grow and will continue to grow, and it has to be aggressive in defending its interests. So these are subjective judgments. And of course, there is a possible error of judgment as well. We might recall how Stalin, for instance, overestimated Soviet strengths and overplayed his hand following World War II. So this is something to be mindful as well. And the third concept is recognition. Here, we are describing how much to what extent Russia's interests and values are accepted abroad by an important, meaningful social community. Usually, historically, this community was Europe, was the West. Today, the situation is changing. The Russians are more and more interested in what reaction their actions will generate in the non-Western ports, in China, and in other Greek, Greek nations. Why? Well. Because the West today, in the eyes of Russian politicians, is certainly less powerful, less Christian, and less respectful of Russia's values. So that's something that makes a difference as well. And why might explain why Putin shifted from being essentially accommodative in the early 2000s to becoming assertive by this idea of recognition, because the West, up, and up until recently, has declined recognition that Putin sought of its interests and values. Let me say a few words about honor, this idea of honor, the myth of honor, if you will, as Russians use it, what it involves. Am I going until one? Okay, so I have another 15 minutes. The definition that I gave you is that it's a system of values and beliefs that expresses state dignity and commitment to relevant social community. And in Russia's case, the structure of Russia's honor, I try to give you a sense of it here, is that it includes two components, external and internal. The external component, of course, has to do with Europeans, with Westerners of Russia. The West, Europe especially, has a very particular, very significant meaning in Russia's psyche, so to speak, in Russia's system of value. It's about belongingness to, with Europe and obligations to Europe. It's about um, commitment to Europe as well. So in this case, honor is translated as um, fairness, loyalty. And Russia, of course, has centuries-long experience in diplomacy and search for multilateral solutions with Europeans. And it's about values as well, that Russians continue to believe unite them with you. Christianity, stability of the continent, respect for sovereignty, great powerness. And Russians, of course, have very vocal pro-Western and pro-European group at home this very deep emotional connection to Europe, especially within the elites. And there's also internal component of this, distinctiveness component. It has to do with Eastern Christianity, 
rather than with simply with Christianity. Russia built on the legacy of Byzantium rather than the, the, the um, Catholic politics. Byzantium, of course, fell to the Turks. And so Russia feels that it, it became a stronghold of Eastern Christianity. It has, as I mentioned earlier, this commitment to social majority and paternalistic state. And it feels that it has obligation to protect cultural belongings. And it has particular effects on foreign policy. This notion of Roma can be translated into variables. First, if the West perceives Russia as a legitimate partner, with legitimate interests and values, then we're likely to expect cooperation operative foreign policy from Russia. If, of course, this recognition is withheld, then we will have either defensiveness or assertiveness. That's a simple matrix that uh, summarizes these hypotheses and expectations. So if you have recognition, you will have some degree of cooperation. On the other hand, if you don't have recognition, then Russian foreign policy may fall in the, one of those two categories. It will be defensive when Russia feels weak, and it will be assertive when Russia feels sufficiently strong. That's roughly what I have done in this book as well. So this is a record. These are the cases, how you can place them along these criteria and these categories. You have multiple cases of cooperation, triple alliance, collective security, war with terrorism, and moving forward towards the so-called reset and modernization alliances. This is how we get formulated Russian foreign policy. And you also have cooperation when Russia is strong, and that's mostly called <coughs> Russia definitively was the power presiding at the Vienna Congress following the Napoleonic era. And defensiveness here, I have cases from pre-Soviet, Soviet and post-Soviet era. That's how I selected those cases. I wanted to have some historical continuity and pick one case from each of these eras. So you have concentration following the Crimean War as defensive case, peaceful. Uh, recognition, NATO, and payment, and of assertiveness, mostly wars. Crimean War, Cold War, Russian Georgia War, and now you might add intervention in Ukraine to it. So, very briefly, that's where we are, that's where the cases are, and if I can comment on some of these cases. And all the lines, of course, was a case of cooperation. Uh, this is where Alexander was shaped by the vision of Christian autocracy. The Crimean War is a case of assertiveness. I'll simply characterize each of them following the historical years. Here, there was a major dispute of over Russian Orthodox communities and their access to holy places. The Tsar demanded before the Sultan that Russian Orthodox rights would be granted in the same way they were granted to Catholics. And he went to war against Sultan, ultimately was defeated. But Nicholas felt very strongly that this war was not just about Black Sea axis, it was not just about strengths. It was also about defending poor religions. And he said, and I quote, that all the Christian parts of Turkey must necessarily become independent, must become again what they formerly were, principalities, Christian states as they re-enter the family of the Christian states of Europe, unquote. So to him, it was also a commitment to the Eastern Christian values. Then, of course, he was defeated, and Russia uh, entered a new era of defensiveness as a defeated power. It went into relative isolation from European affairs after the Crimean War. It did not actively supply troops in Europe everywhere, and it built flexible policies with respect to France and Britain on the one hand, and Russia, ultimately Germany, on the, on the other. Why? Because of this treatment of uh, Russia as a defeated secondary power by Europeans, and because of low confidence. As we said, confidence makes a difference. Russia was in no shape to pursue assertive foreign policy. And then post-Soviet cases, the war with terrorism. These are the cases that were more familiar with. The cooperation based 
on the threat to Russia from terrorism. Mm -hmm. Russia reached out to the United States, as you remember, after September 11th, it pledged all kinds of resources from intelligence to support a military bases in Central Asia for fighting terrorism. Why? Because the West, too, was very much willing to cooperate at the time. Because Russia, of course, had its own problems with terrorism. And ultimately, that triggered this concept of cooperative honor. George Bush very prominently recognized Russia as a partner partner that suffered from the same evil of terrorism. He engaged Russia in all kinds of discussions about future membership in NATO. At the time, as surprising as it may sound today, NATO Secretary Lord Robertson supported Bush in this vision and advocated the idea of giving Russia a status equal to the alliance 19 permanent members at the time, including Peter Powell over Central Asia. And of course, domestically, Russia had its own problems with terrorism in the Caucasus. Um, to give you just one example, in August 1999, Chechen rebels led by Shamil Basayev and Arab fighter Hatab occupied parts of the neighboring, neighboring Republic of Dagestan. Bombs exploded in Moscow, killing hundreds of um, residents at the time. So this is something that triggered a new expectation and a new concept that actually wasn't that new. Historically, it was already established. What I think realists don't hear here, and realists usually emphasize rationality again, most common realist explanation here is that Putin was weak. Russia was weak, and so we had to cooperate, as we said. But it wasn't really so rational to many Russians at the time. Only 15% of Duma members supported Vladimir Putin's direction. Many in the army did not support this direction. So Putin took a personal risk at the time. Many recommended to the Kremlin to strengthen ties with China and non-Western states, and certainly not to allow any space in the middle in, the, in the Central Asia for US military bases. Then NATO's story is a story of defensiveness. Let me skip this one in the interest of time, and I'll be happy to comment in the questions and answers time as well. And then, of course, assertiveness, Russia-Georgia war. Escalation in Russia-Georgia relations after attempts to cooperate with, with Georgia following the so-called Rose Revolution, the Ajari crisis, and ultimately, escalation, spy scandals, sanctions over Georgian wine, recalled ambassadors, um, <coughs> You name it. All the all the developments of diplomatic confrontation, ultimately military confrontation in August, Russia's defeat of Georgia, and recognition of North State and Abkhazia. Why a lot of it has to do with Russia's ignored concerns in the Caucasus, and with Russia's internal willingness and ability, in this case, to act on its interests. Those concerns had to do with security had to do with NATO expansion, had to do with the determines, determination of the Bush's administration to give MAP membership action plan to NATO to both Georgia and Ukraine. They had to do with other security policies that were pursued by Western nations in the offices and in Europe. That, that was one of the red lines that Russians uh, drew very quickly, and they felt that at this point they had to act on this. Again, common account is that Russia simply wanted to dominate the region. That's a common realist thinking in this case. Again, if you listen to John Hirschheimer, then the idea of regional hegemony is what ultimately drives Russia. But it is also important to emphasize that Russians felt necessary not just to deal with NATO expansion, but also to protect small nationalities in the Caucasus. Those who, were, who wanted Russia for Russia's protection for four years, uh, Ossetians, Abkhazians, did not see Russia as a hegemon, did not see Russia as the biggest builder in the world. They saw Georgia as the biggest builder in the world, because Georgia in the early 90s engaged in these policies, policies of uh, Georgia for Georgians, this is how the destabilization of Georgia began. And Russia only later somehow contributed to this. So now was the time combined with 
security imperatives to react and somehow to extend protection to small nationalities <coughs> in the Caucasus. And that aspect of values, culture, plays a role as well. Since I have uh, only a few minutes left, let me talk about implications of this, of this uh, idea of honor for understanding contemporary foreign policy. And then we can, we can elaborate in questions and, and, and answers. What would be the direction of foreign policy, Russian foreign policy for Vladimir Putin today? Uh, is the very important question. Right. This is already Putin 3.0. We have had Putin 1.0, and then another assorted Putin, and then the third uh, recently elected president. And clear, it's not going to be, at this point, it's not going to be defensive foreign policy. Uh, it's possible that there would be elements of cooperation, but at this point, clearly, it's assorted foreign policy. If we are to follow this approach, we will need to make sense of his vision, he would need to make sense of his sense of confidence, his perception of confidence. And if we would need to analyze the uh, recognition aspect as well. To what extent the West is planning or willing somehow to accommodate Russia, to move Russia halfway. Russia's vision at this point is still work in progress, but we already hear a new plan new distinct language of Russia as a civilization, Russia as a nation with distinct values, distinct cultural self-standing. If I am to quote from Vladimir Putin, there is one meaningful quote. If, he said in one of his State of the Union speeches, if the nation loses vital references and ideals, it does not need an external enemy, because it will fall apart on its own. Possibly by being pressured by the West on human rights reasons, Putin has rediscovered the need to reveal the system of values as well. Russia is currently presented as indispensable in stabilizing world order, as a nation that is not only European but Eurasian, as a nation that has established its own historically sustainable system of values. And increasingly you hear the language that Europeans and Western countries themselves are failing on values account. They are not as Christian, they are not as respectful of traditional values, and we will stand firm because these are our values. So that's the vision, I and mean, we can elaborate on this. There is quite a bit coming out from the Kremlin on, on this notion of new Russia civilization at this point. The second one is also interesting, and that's confidence, another known unknown. And it's a challenge to get it right, the uh, notion of confidence. There are different sources of confidence, not just economic success, military success, it could be uh, victories, the sense of, again, of that sense of accomplishment that Putin certainly has uh, as president. Uh, even sport victories, right? Russia had extremely successful uh, Olympiada and then Universiada only last year. Very impressive. So what shapes the Kremlin perception in this case is not just economic weakness, but also to what extent Putin can control the intra elite conflict how much the opposition is, is controlled, uh, whether he is enough supported domestically, and he has plenty of support, incidentally, today. More than 80% of the Russian population strongly behind Putin. So, um, relative to Medvedev and relative to previous developments, and certainly given what happened after, after Crimea was added uh, to Russia as a legitimate uh, part of Russia, Putin has plenty of support and he certainly feels confident at this point. And that means that the last variable, the last, last concept, is really making all, all the difference. Recognition. Known unknown number three. Getting it right is somewhat easy. And recognition, of course, is a, is a concept that needs to be spelled out as well. There are different degrees of recognition, different types, diplomatic, foreign policy, sanctions, power, influence. And the simple characterization is that it's lacking at this point on the Western part. 
Russia's security concerns include missile defense system, stable Middle East, stable former Soviet Union, and it's also about the Eurasian Union and Russia's ability to engage into meaningful economic relationships with Ukraine that is not a member of the European or the Eurasian Union. This is how it all started, as you remember, last year. It's also about values. Russia certainly is not a liberal democracy. It's rather an attempt to rebuild a strong state model. And that's the model that is absolutely essential for Putin, for, for the Kremlin. That's not the model that the Kremlin is going to give up and some, somehow to return to the 90s. That's out of the question. And the more you pressure on Ru Russia on this one, the more likely you hear, you hear opposition, the more likely you will have assorted foreign policy. The language that sometimes is used that Russia is engaged in despicable foreign policies on the wrong side of history are also the languages that are not read by the Kremlin as a standard recognition. Just the opposite, right? And then, of course, sanctions, too, in this context, are likely to be counterproductive. They will make a difference in the sense that they will undermine Russian economy. They will undermine Russia's connection and dependence on the West. But they will not achieve what they are meant to achieve by, by being introduced in the first place, which is compliance with Western foreign policy priorities, particularly in Ukraine. So, uh, in, some, in many respects, that means that means that in the next five or ten years, unless we will have uh, a, a willingness and attempt to engage in a meaningful dialogue with Russia, so all its interests, all its values, we will have more assertive foreign policies. I will stop here. Thank you.